Uh, our first speaker tonight is uh, Dave Richardson. Richards. 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 <laughs> I'm sorry, I know a Dave Richardson. That's the problem. <laughs> but he didn't come. But he didn't come. That's right. <laughs> All right, Mr. Richards uh, has graduated from the University of Texas and Baylor uh, University. Uh, he was he has admissions to practice in the Supreme Court of Texas, the Supreme Court of the U United States, the Supreme Court of New Mexico, U.S. Courts of Appeal, the Fifth and the D.C. Circuits, and several U.S. District Courts. He's been in the practice of law for 50 years uh, in Texas and uh, to some extent in New Mexico. Um, the, his public sector employment included a staff attorney for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and Executive Assistant Attorney General of Texas from 82 to 85. Um, he has, um, he has uh, two publications, Once Upon a Time in Texas, A Liberal in the Lone Star State, and Developing a Coherent Due Course of Law Doctrine. Um, and um, he, has, uh, work, he has worked on litigation that involved um, a successful challenge to racial gerrymandering, the uh, challenge to exclusion of student voters, the challenge to congressional redistricting, and he has done several First Amendment right uh, litigations, labor and employment litigation, and state constitutional litigation. Um, tonight he is going to be speaking on the requirements and the processes of redistricting in Texas. I bet you came state, straight from the Capitol. <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty much. I was, in fact, on a call where my name, my name was being invoked on the floor. I, just did. <laughs> I don't know what they were saying about me. <laughs> All lies, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Take off? Okay. Take off. Well, redistricting at the state level uh, is, of course, data-driven. And the data that uh, at least is significant is the state of Texas now has something around 24 million people. The Anglo population, 46%, the Hispanic population, 36%, the black population, 12%, and the Asian population, 4%. The growth over the last decade, 89% uh, of the growth in the state was non-Anglo. 65% of it was Hispanic. For the first time in our memory, the black population growth exceeded the Anglo or white population of the state. And this was a remarkable change in terms of our demographics. You can forget, despite the notion of our inter person who introdu introduced us, that the Texas legislature cares anything about compact districts, yeah. communities <laughs> of interest, or anything else that might be rational in the redistricting <laughs> process. So get that out of your system and let's talk about the real world. Okay. Redistricting in Texas uh, was essentially non-existent until 1948. Uh, that is, the law required it, but the legislature didn't do it. In 1948, Texas adopted a constitutional amendment which created the Legislative Redistricting Board for the first time to sort of push the legislature into redistricting. The problem was at that time, and was up until 1966, that the courts simply did nothing about redistricting. It was perceived to be, in the words of Justice Frankfurter, a political question over which the courts really had no role. So nothing happened. I mean, I say nothing and nothing happened. One person, one vote decision, Baker versus Carr, came uh, 66. That triggered the entire revolution in Texas. At that time, for example, the Texas Constitution provided that no more than one senator could be from any county. So at that point, of course, about a third of the population was in Dallas and Harris counties, but they were, each only had one senator. 
litigation in the late 60s voided that. Suddenly, in by 1967, Harris County had four senators, Dallas had three, Bear had two, and the world began to dramatically change in Texas. Two, three years later, I was involved in a lawsuit that created single-member districts in the legislative process. And so for the first time, a place like Dallas County, which was electing 18 legislators at large, suddenly had to elect uh, by individual districts. Harris County went to single-member districts in 1972. Those elections produced in Harris County, for example, uh, Craig Washington, it produced uh, Mickey Leland, it, changed, it transformed the Texas legislature essentially in terms of what it looked like, if nothing else. And that's, so from this point forward, by the 70s, then redistricting really was at the forefront. And then it became, of course, a matter of, by, 19, by in the 70s when we redistricted, we sat at kitchen tables with big mats, right? <laughs> and had what we call enumeration districts, and we tried to draw off things. But of course, by now, they have a computer system over here, the Red Apple, which you can punch a button with a 30 seconds know that it, this district you just drew, how it voted in every single race in the last 20 years. I mean, so there's nothing at all left to chance in the sense of how the process works. Okay. That's the background. The law is that it is for the House and Senate. The House, uh, the Senate has 31 members. Their ideal uh, Senate seat this time around is 811,000. The House has 150 members. The ideal seat is 167,000. We have four new congressional seats. We've moved to 36 congressional seats. So Congress now, the congressional seats are smaller than state Senate seats. The Senate a congressional seat will be around 660,000. The State Board of Education has 15 seats, mm -hmm. if you think about it. That's going to be a district of about 1,600,000. I mean, if you want idiocy, is to think about how anyone could win. I guess they put a map up here, it's sort of suggestive of the uh, State Board of Education. It's right behind yeah. you. Okay, well, I mean, this is not, uh, utter, utter, it's already utter nonsense in terms of people who are elected to it, but it's really going to be utter nonsense the thought that this is even potentially a democratic process. All right. The voting, uh, the constraints on redistricting in the legal sense, we begin with one person, one vote. With respect to Congress, the Supreme Court has insisted essentially at zero deviation. Those districts are going to be drawn, and they can be drawn by the computer, down to basically pure population equality. <coughs> With respect to State House and Senate, the law is a little murkier, and uh, the state has operated in the past on the notion that uh, deviation would tolerate a 10% up or down. That basically means 5% over. 5% under, and that may well still animate redistricting at the House and Senate level, although there is at least one decision, court decision which casts some doubt upon that. So that's where you are with respect to uh, the law with respect to Senate redistricting counties. I mean, it, that's just open game. They can draw whatever they want to draw. The only restraints are legal restraints are whatever deviation if it's a 10 percent and I'll really get to the Voting Rights Act in a second. The, but whatever, they can cut county lines, they can run a whole map, do whatever they want to do. House redistricting, house let state house is still constrained by a constitutional provision in Texas which says with some Supreme Court opinions on top of it that County lines in the cutting or in the formation of house districts may be cut only if necessary to achieve population equality. So when they get over here and they start do, doing house reapportionment, they will typically, and they're doing it now tonight, right? That's right, right now. They're right now. It. Yeah. They allocate seats. And Travis County will get, I guess, their five seats, right? Six. Six, I guess now, that's right. Dallas and Harris will get those seats allocated and they chop them up in the, you know, in 
internal. So the house county line uh, remains somewhat sanctified in the redistricting of the Texas House. Okay, so the restraints, legal restraints are one person, one vote. Texas was covered by the Voting Rights Act, effectively 1975. And our experience under the Voting Rights Act has been, in my opinion, somewhat mixed. It's been used by Republicans as a hammer during Bush administrations, and it's so I mean, there are those who would say it's been perfect. My reaction to it is it's been a mixed bag, but it is there. And any redistricting plan, if the House, Senate, any plan whatsoever, Travis County or anywhere else, must be pre-cleared is the term that's used under the Voting Rights Act. And pre-clearance under the Voting Rights Act is uh, historically been uh, done by the Department of Justice, that is the submitting body in this instance, the Secretary of State, tenders the plans to the Department of Justice, sends up a bunch of data, and the bureaucrats fiddle with it and something comes up. Uh, that's one option. The other statutory option, and there is some indication from Republican circles this time, is that they avoid the Justice Department and go directly to a three-judge federal court convened in the District of Columbia. And, and they can, that's an alternative route for uh, pre-clearance. And there is, I guess, in the public circle some fear that an Obama Justice Department might be more critically, critically examining the, the submission from Texas. But nothing that no plan, redistricting plan, can be put in effect until it has been pre-cleared through one of those two processes. And if we were to rely on history, every time I've been involved in everyone now since 1970, the, uh, what happens is that we've got, we've been so idiotic with creating March primaries I mean, the old days, you may remember, but you may remember, you'd be the only one who remembers. We had primaries in July. And uh, for whatever reason, we kept pushing them, pushing them uh, earlier. So there's no chance, never been a chance, that any of these plans ever get approved in time for people to file for office. I mean, that's the other reality that functions here. It's a timing function. You get, to, if the legislature, even if they enact them, you can't get them pre-cleared in time for the filing deadline. So every year since circa 1980, there's been a three-judge court case convened here in Texas, and some three-judge court adopts interim plans to run the primaries, and we're probably going to end up there this time no matter what. If the legislature does not enact a plan, and there's every chance of that, I suppose, don't you think? There's a chance. Uh, that triggers the voting rights, I mean, triggers the legislative redistricting board, which is con uh, steps in its place, and it's been convened, I think, every time now since 1980, to adopt plans. The board is, consists of the lieutenant governor, the attorney general, the speaker of the house, controller of the general, uh, commissioner of the general land office. The plans that you suffer under today here in Travis County were adopted by the Legislative Redistricting Board last time, and your former mayor, Carol McClellan, is the person who zapped you. If you have any questions about it, you go back and look at what happened 10 years ago. That's why you got what you got 10 years ago from the Legislative Redistricting Board. All right. I think that's it.